This is uh, this is a great pleasure to me this evening to see to see so many people, some of whom I know, many of whom I know, and some of whom I don't, um, at this Arthur Conan Doyle Centre Zoom lecture. It's the last of our spring series, and as you know, there won't be one next week. But then the um, the following Tuesday, um, we start again. I'm sorry, this was this is the end of the winter series, isn't it? We start again with, with the spring series where we have twelve amazing people uh, talking, and we have an amazing person talking tonight, an old friend of mine. Um, Ian McGilchrist, who um, some decade ago and more um, wrote a very, very well received book, which many of you have read, um, The Master and His Emissary, in, in, in which he took on practically everybody, and he has the equipment to take on practically everybody, um, who are people who are interested in how, how we think and how culture has developed, basing it on the metaphor and the reality of the two halves of the brain. And, and it, that's what he moved to. It's, um, Ian is my most maddening friend because he got the job that I wanted and then went and did a completely different job and became more famous in that job than, than, than he had in the previous one or I ever did in mine. I mean, that he was an Inglit, Inglit Don like myself and he became a fellow of all souls, which is very distinguished and then wrote a book saying that it wasn't really his thing and, um, and, and became a doctor and a psychiatrist. And, and he has his finger in many pies as those of you who've read his book will know. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to bang on uh, even about him because I think we need to get to it and this is going to be um, a little bit of a dialogue because there are things we all need to know and there will be an opportunity of course especially if you put questions into the chat for you to also to ask ask you know, things you might want to um, know about yourselves and I, I think what I'd like to do is to really say as I often do in the beginnings of these talks remind people how lucky we are because Ian is old enough and I'm certainly old enough to remember when the sorts of things we're talking about tonight, the sorts of things that Ian has published about and is about to publish about again, he has written a book those of you who read The Master and His Emissary may quail slightly substantially longer than The Master and His Emissary. Um, and it's going to be a book called The Matter with Things and it's, it's I mean I've read quite a lot of it it's absolutely fantastic I mean really amazing. Um, you know those sorts of things were not available 50 years ago in the way they are now and the, the seriousness with which questions such as consciousness or the spiritual or man's relationship to nature in a more than purely mechanical way these things were not at the forefront of the intellectual world and and they are now and one of the reasons is that people have been pushing the rock it's a sisyphean task at times but people have been pushing the rock and for the last 10 15 years Ian has been one of one of the great pushers and we at the Arthur Conan Doyle Center are trying to push along with him anyway what I'd like to <laughs> ask um, uh, Ian as a sort of first question um, to go back almost to basics as it were um, we are all trying to get beyond much as we respect science of course we're all trying to get beyond the, the rather simple-minded scientific materialist paradigm one of the things that people say Ian about it more recently is that of course the materialist paradigm is in fact metaphysical it's not as mm. if we are out here in the clouds and the angels and the woo-woo and talking about flimsy things like consciousness and they've got their feet on the ground and they're not going to go to the, to the heavens at, at any price you know scientific materialism is also a declaration about metaphysics Absolutely, yes. And uh, of course, one of the things that um, that happens is that if scientists are not interested in thinking about the, the philosophy of the work that they're doing, they imagine that philosophy plays no part. Um, and that if they were to adopt um, a metaphor or a myth or something, that would be to get in the way of science. But of course, um, the machine is itself a metaphor and a myth. It has its own mythology. And it is, as you say, a metaphysical position. You can't avoid it. Um, so the I would totally agree about that. My My main thrust in the matter with things, actually, is to try and rebuff and show why it's entirely inadequate this paradigm of uh, reductive materialism um, and I you know you won't be surprised to learn that I think like Bernardo Castro 
that consciousness is an ontological primary. In fact, I, I often say, you know, what is this about the problem of consciousness? Consciousness is the least problematic thing we know because we live in it and everything we know is in it. Um, what is rather more problematic is quite what the hell matter is. What is this stuff? Um, I only know about matter because I have consciousness, but I don't know that I only have consciousness because of matter. I mean, that might be the case, but I suspect it isn't. So, uh, yes, I think it's in, it's the primary element. And uh, it, 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 uh, you say, and I like your optimism that, this has all changed and I know exactly what you mean but we still are blessed with a lot of scientists who do a lot of public speaking um, it, it, indeed Richard Dawkins held a chair for the promulgation of science in, in you know to the people uh, uh, and it's that uh, that voice of science that I object to real science is not in any way um, problematic, nor is it a purely left hemisphere exercise. It involves a great deal of intuitive thought, imagination, um, using analogies, using shapes, using um, not just serial propositions. That's, uh, that's actually a very small part of science. But I think it's what a lot of people are trained at school to think that you do step A and then you step B and so on. And it's all entirely um, objective what you find at the end of it. But in fact, if, if scientists had to test every single proposition just in case there might be something in it and they didn't want to have a prejudice towards certain kinds of proposition, it would never Never get off the ground at all. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yes, of course. And I mean, th that interests me a lot because it strikes me that um, I've thought um, for 20, 30 years that, that the difficulty is scientific materialism and, and it, it doesn't do enough and it, it claims too much and so on. And if you say Richard Dawkins, that's, that's exactly the thing. But I suppose there are other levels of society and you mentioned schools and, you know, there's sort of what the top scientists or certain top scientists are, you know, Brian Cox are proclaiming loudly that we're all woo woo and they've got some objective truth. And I mean, we, we do tangle quite strongly there and I think we're making some progress. Below that, there's what's taught, you know, first year undergraduates and, and then in school, creating assumptions from when children are quite young about what the nature of things is. And, and then below that, or I below is not really right, but as well, there's just a popular opinion. And I, what do you think about that? I mean, I feel that popular opinion is rather on our side. I mean, you know, why are there 101 people, you know, tuning in on, uh, tonight, you know, um, to you? I mean, they're, they're not going to hear that scientific materialism is right. So, so maybe, maybe the popular opinion is quite good. Maybe the middle slice, though, is going to become the problem that children are not taught anything else i mean no school is going yes. to say you must yes. be a scientific materialist marxist whatever you know no no school is <laughs> going to say that but they do leave out other things yes. personal experiential things you know some artistic things even i think yes i mean you 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 mentioned the word objective um <clears throat> as though somehow there was no such thing and that might be something we could come back to because while there probably isn't in a sense that it's often understood it is a very important part of my thesis that some things are truer than others and they're tested against experience which is effectively what the best part of the scientific method comes down to uh, but that's not just true of science that's true of life and it's tr it's true of the philosophy called pragmatism, which has nothing to do with believing what is pragmatically convenient, but instead is about believing things that are tested out on, on experience. And uh, you, the, the best way of thinking of pragmatism is that if you hold a certain view, um, if, if, if it is pragmatically sound, you'll be less often caught out by experience than if you took a different view. That is really the point. So, um, of course, there is objectivity, but it doesn't have anything to do. And of course, it's not objectivity isn't just that there's a truth out there and we play no part in it. That's absolutely right. I'd love to talk about that. Um, but, you know, science at school, when I was studying it, I remember the most boring part was the part that by now to me seems easily the most fascinating, which is physics. 
And uh, I remember how we were taught about physics, doing these incredibly mechanical experiments, proving the stunningly obvious at great length. And I thought, well, God, what a waste of time. But if, if instead they started talking to me about um, you know, black holes and quantum mechanics and things like that, I would have been utterly gripped because I had a philosophical mm. mind and that would have you know, alerted me to the fact that this is an area you really need to know more about. And it's taken me, you know, a while in my life to to get round to um, physics, which plays a reasonable part in this new book. Yes, I, I know. One, one of the, yeah, go on, sorry. Go on. No, no, I was only going to say, I mean, one of the, th you, you mentioned how um, these reductive materials think they're being you know they're hard and they're you know nothing woo woo and they're, uh, they're just hard nosed and down to earth and all the rest and um physicists uh, tend to take the view that when these um people come to them and they're usually biologists that most physicists gave up on this mechanical 19th century um uh, hydraulic idea of, of the universe a very long time ago, but that when they say, you know, the problem of consciousness and so on, and we, 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 it's, it's all got to be reduced to matter, physicists sort of get very uneasy, um, look at their feet, go rather sheepishly, it's a bit complicated. So um, I, I think, you know, the, the, the idea that consciousness plays a part in the truths of science is accepted in physics and has been for a very long time, but seems to be, um, you know, rather foreign to people who work in the area of life, <laughs> the science of life, biology. <laughs> very strange. Do, do you think the, the metaphor of parts and holes is integral to your thinking and integral to, to your new book? That, for example, I mean, the, the reductio ad absurdum would be that, 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 that um, science materialist science is inclined to reduce things to the smallest parts which explain bigger parts and really bigger parts are only explicable in that way whereas Rupert Sheldrake and yourself and many others um, are trying to you know um, revive the, th the theories of someone like Goethe and of course a lot of ancient Greeks to the effect that there are actually holes with a W as well as holes without W um, in the universe and that things are actually made up of, of smaller parts of course but not entirely explained by them. Is, is that one of the ways you're going about things? Well, parts, uh, yes, in, in brief, but uh, parts and holes, like so many other things, are a product of how we attend to the world. Um, anything that we think of as a part can be also thought of as a whole in respect of something else. And anything that we think of as a whole can be a part of something greater. So there is a sort of nested hierarchy of things. And depending on where you direct your attention, you see a whole or a part. Now, it's quite extraordinary that we believe that only by going downwards to more basic elements do we understand what we're dealing with. Because it's just as true, just as true, and I would say probably even truer, that we only understand something by realizing what holes it can be a constituent part of. Mm. So it tells you something about part A, that it can end up in bringing into being the whole that is B. Uh, for example, um, you, you know, it tells you something about uh, music, that a note, a single note, uh, means nothing on its own, but a lot of them together make Beethoven's Mr. Solemnis. And, and so they have the capacity, the potential in them. And when they are seen as connected in a whole, then they, that tells you something about what a musical note is. Whereas if you go the other way around, what is music? And you go down and down and down, you just end up with single notes, which, which don't tell you anything about music. So, so, so it's very often true that we should be looking upwards, not downwards. Well, well, I mean, everybody watching this is, as far as I can tell, um, uh, listening to you, as far as I can tell, is a human being. Now, <laughs> let's, without necessarily getting into artificial intelligence, could I ask you the question, what about that sense of, of the whole that is an individual? I mean, 
clearly, I mean, you're a psychiatrist. Clearly, you have seen people who have, you know, multiple personality disorders. You've seen people who are, and of course, we all know there is an unconscious, which is part of us and yet not currently part of us if it's unconscious. We all know, and, and, and we don't really use the word soul very much, although some people around the Arthur Conan Doyle Center would still want to use it. I mean, what is it about human beings that makes them, well, obviously more than a thing and, and, and a particular whole? I mean, if we're not gonna just say we're a bunch of atoms, you know, how would you form a human being, as it were, in your thoughts? Is it just I think what, what I certainly wouldn't do is suppose that I find out more and more about a person by taking them down to the tiniest parts, so that we are just a soup of genes or whatever it is. Um, going back to the question of the parts and the whole, that there are things that cannot be foreseen in the basic elements that arise when things are seen together in ever greater holes. Um, you know, a great piece of music being a very obvious example, but we couldn't predict from the behavior of a few molecules how a particular cell is organized and works. So you you can you can certainly find out after the fact that this cell is you know composed of these substances that chemistry recognizes and so forth but presented with the ingredients you wouldn't be able to envisage this this cell so the the, the way of understanding things um is to see how they are in relation to as many other things as is possible because it's in those relationships that they exist one of my themes in this book is that relationships are prior to relata they're prior to the things that are related mm. and, th and that sounds paradoxical because to our normal way of thinking how can you have a relationship if you haven't already got the things that are going to be related but that's because we prioritize things and think that effectively the world is made up of things and that we put them together in various ways as we would put together a bicycle and that it's like that that things come into being but but it isn't and um so uh, what what we understand as being um, a whole is something that we have to experience from as many different points of view as possible. And that gets us near to the idea of what objectivity is. Objectivity is not just adopting one very peculiar standpoint in which you you feel that this thing is totally alien to you. In fact, that's more likely to... Um, to induce a very strange cast of mind in which most of the important things about it are no longer visible to you or, or attended to, but instead to try inhabiting as many different points of view as possible. And indeed, this is how we come to understand the truth about any particular matter, is not just to follow one path. Well, I've established A and then there's B and then there's C and finally I arrive at my goal, which is D. But often you have to go around something. You have to see it in the round. You have to take different views, none of which is in itself the whole truth, but contains a part of the truth. And if you don't adopt those different points of view, you're missing something quite important. So the, the idea that we need to have a multiplicity of ways of thinking, flexibility in our models and metaphors is very, very important because it enables the creative part of our mind uh, to, to latch on to something that is going to work uh, for it, which will be an image or a metaphor or a shape or a form that helps illuminate something. And if we simply stick... Uh, as the left hemisphere tends to do to one particular way of thinking, then we miss those other possibilities. Mm. Yes, indeed. Well, I, if we can just stick to the very big uh, again for a little while, I've got some other things I want to get down to, um, possibly in, in, into the neuroscience or again into the brain, which you know a lot more about than I do. But um, just on the big, I mean, I mean, in a sense, this is the, this is the biggest of all. Um, I know you have a very strong personal relationship with nature. And I know that it's something you've thought about a lot, both, both in the human body and, and, and in, of course, what we normally call nature, which is outside the window there. And uh, of course, I mean, physics is meant to be the theory of the whole of nature. And, and of course, you can go right down to the things which are so small that nobody's ever seen them, and you can go right up to very macro levels. Do you, 
I mean, is there anything to be said, especially if you if you put consciousness into it or something, anything to be said that would show that nature is, as the ancient again, the ancient Greeks would have thought, in some sense, a whole and an entirety. I don't mean that it was something which has purpose and meaning necessarily, but slightly stepping in that direction. Yes. Well, I would go so far as to say that it has purpose or meaning, but I don't invoke an engineering God in saying that. Mm. Um, I think we miss uh, the purpose and meaning because of the strange way in which we approach everything in the world these days, mm. uh, being forced uh, by circumstance and also by habit of thought to eschew the very ways of relating to the thing which would enable it to reveal its meaning. I, I, I must make the point that it, when reductive scientists talk about, you know, the possibility that there might be, um, you know, that things can make things seem to have meaning, they imagine that this is a pleasant fantasy that helps us, you know, poor, feeble creatures that haven't got the stern stuff they're made of to get through life, you know, a comforter. But it, I, I very strongly um would resist that and suggest in this book that actually these things are not things that we invent but things that we discover they're there and it's only a habit of mind that deliberately averts attention from them and doesn't go towards meeting them that means that they don't respond to us because everything is responsive nature is responsive to us and we are responsive to it just as people are to one another so that we're not living in a in a sort of unidirectional um, cosmos. It is a reverberative cosmos at every single level. Um, it's the relationships between these levels and between these things out of which the meaning comes. And I, I would say that nature is a whole, yes, but it's also wonderfully unpredictable. And Goethe had something marvelous to say about this, which as he did about so many things, um, because he spotted, uh, you know, very, very deep thing for me, which is there in Heraclitus, and it goes all the way through a stream of philosophy that's been largely ignored through to the 19th century and, and, and onwards, which is that we need both division and union, but we need them to be unified. So it seems to me that the business of the cosmos is as much about individuation the bringing into being of new things, that's the creativity, is that out of this, whatever it is, things start to appear that, as I was saying, couldn't have been forethought of. Um, and that is part of the drive of the cosmos. But in doing that, very importantly, it is not fragmenting, it is not breaking up a whole, it is not atomizing uh, its existence, it's individuating it in unique, ever unique, everything that exists is unique in a way. Uh, it, it, that bringing about of uniqueness is still within the overarching hmm. tent, if you like, of the whole. And it's keeping those two things together. Because of the way we now think, and I think it's very much indebted to the left hemisphere, we tend to think it's got to be one thing or another. You know, people say all is one, you know, and I, I'm sure the people listening tonight who have said all is one. And, and when they, people say that to me, I, I sort of, uh, I think, yes, very true, but um, all is many as well. Now, what about that? And it, these two truths are equally important and you can't do away with one or the other, because if you do, the whole creative nature of things will fall apart them literally um so i do see it as a whole but i see it as an ever self-differentiating whole and indeed i think that the divine element in the cosmos and the consciousness that we are part of is something which is all the time generating truly new things not just versions that we could have thought of of the old bits put together in a new order but actually newness that is unforeseen I, I'm a great admirer of Mary Midgley, and she says a wonderful thing somewhere. Where is all this drama about the, you know, about a human being being an alien in the cosmos? Um, 
what is all this? Why do we imagine ourselves as these poor, lonely, heroic figures struggling to find meaning and purpose in the universe, to find beauty and to, to create? I mean, the fact that we can, that, that there is beauty, that there is creativity, that there is the possibility of the St. Matthew passion has to be in the cosmos. Where else can it come from? Mm. The cosmos is such that it can, at some point, produce the St. Matthew Passion. So it's not an alien place, it's, an, it's our home. And we owe something to it, to, to recognize it, to help nourish all that is creative in it. And it will do the same for us. So our role here is to be part of that process in which there is always interaction. It's never one thing that's happening. It's always a relationship. Yes, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's, that's very clear. Um, I'm going to do the chat questions later, but I do notice that Michael Hall has put a comment in the chat here, which I'll read to you. Um, I thought you might like it, actually. I certainly do. Nature is connected through the fractal resonance and patterning of the golden section as understood by Plato. That's certainly Plato. Um, I, rather, I do like that sort of fractal, you know, that, that resonant repetition that is implied by fra fractalness. And, and you use the word resonance, I think, yourself there. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's very true. And I, I talk about, uh, you'll be amazed to learn, about fractality and about the golden section mm. in the book. Mm. Um, and I think these are intrinsic to a cosmos that is naturally beautiful and naturally complex, which is not to say that it's an entirely comforting place. Um, built into it is also things that strike awe and terror into us, quite rightly. And it's capable of all sorts of things. But we, each of us, however small we seem, contribute to the nature of that cosmos by the way in which we respond to it and it, it invites the the answer well yes okay i see that in my tiny way i leave my footprints but really in the sum of things they don't add up to anything but that is to be thinking in again a rather mechanical and um quantifying way which is the typical way of the left hemisphere um abraham heschel a, a, a wonderful um the incredibly wise uh, rabbinic uh, scholar of the last century says um, that um, we, we, oh gosh, I forgot what I was going to say now. Um, <laughs> where, where were we? <laughs> Remind me. Um, <laughs> well, yes, I'm sorry, I can't, I, can't, <laughs> I can't do Herschel with you, but it, it must be something to do with the um, position of man in the cosmos that you're talking about. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, it, it's exactly that. The thing that he says is that for the person who sees with a quantifying eye, then each person is just a small part of something, but that he who appreciates the quality of humanity and of the person sees it the way that the divine sees it, which is that every person, is, every life is as important as all life. Now, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily an original point of view, but I think it's a very good one. So yes, um, fractality and um, the, the, the nesting of things in this way, in which they, um, they create something new, which is a variation on something before and grows organically, is, is a far more, I think, real um, model of how nature works than that of um, just mechanisms. I might just say, in case there are people who are very um, keen on mechanisms, um, and, and, and I'm sure that um, even people who come to the ACDC um, may be grateful for the mechanisms that have enabled uh, for example, us to create treatments for disease. I mean, that's close to my heart as a doctor. So we can intervene in some causal chain in order to change the outcome of something. But another thing related to the, the scale point that I was making that, you know, the, the, the size is, is, if you think in a certain way, your small size is, is one thing. If you think in another, it, it, it's, it's quite different. When, when you look at a very small part of the world, if you take a sort of magnifying glass to it, 
you can see in this enormously complex intersection of chains of causation a, a single line and you can intervene in that and create an outcome. But it would be wrong to extrapolate from the fact that that works at that level to the fact that the whole that you're intervening in is simply linear or mechanical. You can find that element by restricting the view, which is what the left hemisphere does. But it's a mistake to take that away and say, well, that's the model on which life and the world is founded. Yes, I, uh, so to the... the the level at which one is looking changes what it is that one sees. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, I see that. I was hoping to obviously get back to consciousness because once again, I'm not just making a flippant joke when I say that everybody on this Zoom call is conscious and that is really primordial thing because if they weren't, well, what would they be? They wouldn't be here. Anyway, just to go back to consciousness and attach it to what you've just said about nesting, which came out of the discussion of the fractal. I mean, Bernardo Castro and others see consciousness in a rather Hindu way as being very big, um, in fact, a primitive, in fact, primordial, in fact, you know, the universal consciousness, if you want to use those expressions. And of course, we have, I'm perfectly certain that the consciousness which I have at this moment um, is mine. Um, I'm not, you can have split personalities and so on, but essentially I feel that this is my consciousness and I'm pretty sure that you feel that yours is yours. Is yours. Would nesting or something help when trying to put together my consciousness and yours with universal consciousness? I mean, are we nesting in a huge consciousness, just as the materialists have the metaphysic that we, you know, our, our little bits and pieces are nesting in all the other zillions of bits and pieces, which, according to them, make up the entire universe? Well, rather than say that we are, I would say we have to use whatever images, metaphors, models can help us see something. And so I would say, yes, there's something in that model which helps us to understand something, that our consciousness doesn't stand, as it were, alone outside of something else, but is already within something else. So uh, to that extent, I like it. But I also think that there are other models that help me anyway. Um, because we come back to this thing that the cosmos I think the evidence is uh, from a lifetime of looking at this from as many standpoints as I can is about this production of the unique, the individual, the, the creating the, the truly new and bringing into being something that was only before potential and may not even have been known to the divine element until it actually produced it. Mm. Um, there's more to say about that, but anyway, let's just pass on that for the moment. Um, one image that I find very helpful to me is the idea of consciousness as having many sort of limbs, if you like, in the way that a, <clears throat> a cell, a single cell can have outpouchings, um, villi, that, that, you know, that, that, that uh, are on, on the cell. And they're continuous. If you were inside one of these, you would seem to be enclosed until you saw just one little tiny bit at the, the bottom end where you connected suddenly to the entire um, cytoplasm of the cell. But if you were inside it, the temptation would be to see you, you are isolated. You are um, in all directions but one. Um, and what that enables is that the cell can then do things because of these individual growths, if you like, that it couldn't do without them. And but they are not separate from the cell. They are part of the cell. So in that sense, I would see our consciousness as for the time being, my consciousness for the time being, as being uh, sequestered, but not wholly sequestered from the large consciousness, which is the root of everything. And I, I you know, to... to um, spoiler alert, I think that, that um, <clears throat> matter is simply a phase of consciousness, that it's a, an aspect of consciousness under certain circumstances that provides resistance. And I also have a very strong belief that resistance is something we don't understand how valuable it is, how important it is, nor do we understand how important negation is. We think of it as purely, well, negative 
perspective, where <laughs> actually negation is often how things come into being, mm -hmm. and resistance is what enables anything to be what it is. Here, I um, remember William James saying rather nicely about his own soul that it was like it was like his voice that the breath that was part of his voice had no quality and had was simply part of the whole air until it passed through a narrow restriction which was his vocal cords mm -hmm. and through that very restriction something then was shaped that came into being now if if you like that is for me a very useful model for how just about everything um, comes into being. Including consciousness. I mean, so you're seeing the brain, for example, on which you're an expert, as, as a filter, or indeed, as a, like any filter, a, a restriction of perhaps yes. some bigger consciousness coming into our consciousness, something like that. Yes, it, 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 it's, it, forms, um, it forms itself. And here I would say, you know, the two primary things are not, you know, matter and, and, and anything else, but energy and form and the relationship between energy and form is how everything comes about and I, i'm you know very far from um you know not willing to to um acknowledge my debt to rupert sheldrake here in the idea of morphogenetic fields in fact in quantum field theory uh, and in contemporary physics, I think the idea that there are fields, perhaps not the kind that Rupert specifically is talking about, but they are a kind, and I believe he's onto something there, um, but that these fields are what shapes things, and the energy that goes into them is what makes uh, what makes things happen. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, you're going to go on there. No, um, no. You, you, well, I have. You I, carry on. I, once again, I'm being. I'm. I'm. I'm terribly pleased by uh, everyone who's here because um, I almost exactly the question I was going to ask at about this stage has come to us on the chat from um, Nathan Hechtman. He is, um, and it's this one. I mean, in a way, this is the sixty-four thousand dollar question: How do we act on or act out these ideas, which are pretty heady and abstract? I think you've said before, and that's you, Ian. I think you've said before that the right brain needed a left brain defense, and that's why you wrote The Master and His Emissary. But how do we live by these insights rather than just talk about them? We're very good at talking about them. Um, do, do they have any implications for us or for our lives? Uh, they absolutely do. They have uh, implications that are impossible to exaggerate. Um, that's different from my being able to tell your questioner what he must do mm -hmm. and in a way i would rather not do that mm -hmm. um <laughs> not just because uh, i i don't really know the answer because everybody everybody's life contains a different answer but also because i think that what i'm talking about is that we need to see the world a different way the, the the title of my new book, The Matter with Things, is a, is a pun on several levels about our preoccupation with matter and with things. But I'm thinking, I haven't quite finalized the subtitle, but I was going to have it as Our, our Brains, Our World, Our Survival. And it has been objected that it makes it sound like I'm writing a kind of self-help book with five things that we must do in order to survive. And uh, I don't know whether that's a, a just reason for not using that phrase. But the reason I use it is that not only can we not survive, even if we make all kinds of adaptations to do with carbon and what we do to trees and what we do to the oceans and how we treat one another and all these very, very important issues. Not only um, will that not be enough, but if we were able to survive without a change of heart, we wouldn't deserve to do so. There is no point in preserving a world by maintaining um, forests if the only reason we do so is because they um, do something for uh, industry and for commerce and so on. If we don't understand the non-utilitarian sanctity, the beauty 
um, the ensouled and embodied nature of everything that lives, then we are misconceiving the world and sooner or later the same problems will come back, even if they go away very briefly, and I don't think they will go away. Uh, we can't, as has often been said, solve the problems that we find ourselves in by using the same thinking that got us into them in the first place. So the first thing that has to happen is that we have to shift our view. And in the first chapter of my book, I lay out some of the things I'm going to suggest in the book that sound counterintuitive. And one of them is that relationships are primary and that the things that are related come about through the relationship. It's not quite as wacky as it sounds. Um, nothing is anything except what it is in its context. You change the context, you change the thing. So that the relations that the thing has with everything else, and especially with those things immediately around, change what it is. So you don't have a thing that exists prior to its connections. So, that, I mean, that this would apply to a, a rainforest, for example. Absolutely. Um, and it can't be built up simply from elements and you put a lot of them together. I think Ronald Reagan said in the 1960s when somebody said um, that they ought to extend the redwood plantations in California, um, his comment was, a tree is a tree. How many do you need to look at? And it's a, 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 a lovely lo Remark. It suggests uh, precisely what's wrong with, with the idea of starting from a thing and then working up to, to what, what they all make. Um, no, I mean, what we, what we are increasingly realizing, and, and I have been, um, you know, learning more and more about this in recent years, as I've discovered quite how intelligent all kinds of life are, including slime molds. Uh, you don't need neurons to respond intelligently, plants do, and there's a lot being written about that at last. Mm. But actually, even, uh, you know, uh, single cells have intelligence. Um, and that's not a controversial thing to say in, in many um, mainstream biology contexts now. Mm. Um, although there, I'm sure there are plenty of people who would resist it. Um, so... Uh, Yes, I, I think that to, answer, to begin to answer the question, we need lots of people to listen, as it were, to the philosophy I'm trying to put forward. Because as a psychiatrist, I know that when people come to me for help, I, I, I often know right away what it is they need to do. And when I was very wet behind the ears, I used to sort of tell them, but I found that they very rarely listen to what I said, because if they had been able to see that then, they wouldn't have needed to come and see me in the first place. And therefore I had to get them to the point where they could see that for themselves. Um, and so we all need to see this for ourselves and internalize it in our lives. Uh, that will then issue in actions, which I can't now predict, but will be different for every person, but they will have a common quality they will be other directed rather than simply um you know inwardly personally individualistically directed they will take into account what is implicit not just what can be made explicit it will take into account the vast complexity of of individual opinions and people that they're not just members of a category that can be either adored or vilified we need to stop thinking in these very limited categorical terms and start attending to what is really there. We need to change attention. And I'm not the first person, of course, to have said that. And I think it was a rather strong um, element in the philosophy of Simone Weil. Um, but the, I have a question I, I, which might, which might um, from the chat, which comes straight in on this. I've sort of asked yes. it before, but but I mean, we're right on on change of attention, change of consciousness, and so on, and and how yes. exactly that could happen. I mean, Kelly Houston is asking: Is there, in your opinion, a shift in collective consciousness currently taking place? And someone's asking about Jung just after that, by the way. <laughs> Yes. In collective consciousness, is it happening? Well, I think it depends where you look. Um, it's almost too painful to look at some areas of society. Uh, I've more or less stopped 
listening to the news. Um, I don't have a television in any case, but I used to listen a lot to the news and partly the BBC has got um, much less intelligence as, a, as a, an organ than it was. And partly a lot of the news is just so depressing. Um, and there's only so much of it that, that you, can, you can take. Uh, a rather nice Dutch journalist wrote to me years and years ago after reading The Master's Emissary, um, an article he'd published called 13 Reasons Why You Should Not Pay Attention to the News. But anyway, and I think that's quite good coming from a journalist. Um, <laughs> but um, what I would say is that there are glimmerings in certain circles, and I think we self-select. So the sort of people who are here tonight are people who move among people in whom there may be a shift of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I think there's a hunger for a shift of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now that's another matter. And that is actually probably as important as the shift itself. There is a very widespread dissatisfaction with the current paradigm. Mm -hmm. And usually, unfortunately, the dissatisfaction is expressed as being to do with, um, you know, historical categories and, you know, patriarchy and things like that. And it, there may be something in that, but the, there's much more importantly, it's something that we've got into that needs, the, you know, that has served a civilization up to a point, but is now actually destroying it and we're committing suicide. So we do need to change this, this vision. And, and indeed, that may very well, part of it may very well be um, listening much more to what women have to, to, to say about all these questions. I'm sure that's right. I don't think it's helpful, though, to, to sort of have protected categories that are usually right because they belong to the category and others who are always wrong because they belong to another category. You know, I quite agree with that. That's, that's a very well put here. And I like it. Um, there's a couple of questions here about consciousness because that is what we're talking about and it's where we all are mm. all the time. So it's the most important thing, I suppose you could say. Um, I'm not going to ask you Graham Kidd's question, which is, could you please define consciousness? Because we don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> but but I would like to acknowledge Graham Kidd and and, and move on to um uh we, of course we have the collective uh, it, right yes David Moore who asks is consciousness in the sense you're using the term something which happens in all matter not just in human beings and if not I, I know the answer but if not what do you mean by saying matter is simply a phase of consciousness would that mean there was no matter before human beings so, does it happen no not at all mm -hmm. um what it means is that consciousness pre-exists us although it is manifest in us but it is manifest in many other things in fact the things are manifest in consciousness that's really the the point that i'm making that it's a it's an image that that helps me a bit but it no no um simile or or, or metaphor for consciousness can can but almost my definition be right because it's not like anything else it just is what it is mm -hmm. but the but the way i think of it is like water you know water we think of as swiftly moving yielding transparent constantly changing and then there is ice which is opaque solid static and so hard it can split your head open and then there is water in the atmosphere that you cannot see at all or touch or even know is there without having some sort of mechanism for measuring it so all these phases as chemists say and i'm using the term phase in that way that chemists use it the phases of water are very widely different from one another have quite different characteristics and one of the things about ice is that it makes water more permanent for a while now if you come back to the, my idea about resistance being an important part of creation what i see matter as fulfilling in the world is stopping change for a while so that all matter is actually flowing as Heraclitus would have pointed out, but it's flowing much, much more slowly. So behind my house, there is a huge mountain and it appears as solid and static as anything could be. But if you had a time-lapse camera going 
back billions of years, you would see that actually it is the crest of a wave that is flowing and will eventually over, overcome this house. I won't be there at the time. I'm glad to report I'm having a lunch date but um, uh, on that day. But, the, the, but the, you see the point that matter is a way of slowing down and fixing a form for a while in the cosmos. And without something like that, everything would merge and happen as it were together and at the same moment and not be different. So part of the differentiation in the cosmos is the existence of matter, which is a kind of way in which energy and form come together. But consciousness, ideas, thoughts, feelings, principles, values, purpose are also things of a kind that that have their own drive, have their own energy, and have their own particular shapes and forms, which we can see instantiated in matter at times. We can see them impressed, if you like, on matter. When we look at the forms of it, we can see what is happening. Yes, okay, thank you, that's, that, that's terrific. I must say, I do think um, our audience tonight are particularly wonderful because every time I get to the point where I wish to move on to another question, it pops up in the chat. Um, here's one. <laughs> Re remembering this is the Arthur Conan Doyle Center and we are mind, body and spirit. And I know you have, you have a lot to say about that, but um, Johann Baptista, is it Baptista, um, puts in this point. Rupert Sheldrake is not just a philosopher and a biologist, true, but also a prolific parapsychologist. That's true too. Have you thought about integrating the scientific case for Psy into your thesis? That's, that's a home question um, for us. It's a good question. I have thought about it. And I think that in order to, in order to be able to talk about it intelligently, I would have to do a lot of work to say things about the science of the brain. I know quite how countless of the hours that I've had to devote to understanding it and knowing what is true from what is false. And I think if I were somebody like Rupert, who spent many years reading the literature and experimenting and so forth, I would feel more emboldened to say something about it. What I do say is I'm not prepared to dismiss it at all. I'm prepared to give it um, an open mind. And I, but I haven't enough to go on um, to be able to come to an opinion of my own. Okay. And I think in an area like this, it's rather important that you do take care to, it's easy to get carried away by an idea that's attractive and be seduced into thinking that it must therefore be true. But it's also very easy to dismiss an idea which doesn't happen to fit with your uh, particular world picture at the time. And this is all too obvious that we don't see things if we don't expect to see them. Uh, manifestly true in, in, in very obvious ways in, 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 and this has been demonstrated by rather beautiful psychological experiments like gorillas in our midst and so forth. So when we don't expect to see something, we don't see it. And Goethe again said something rather interesting that we, a faculty in us develops, uh, we have the potential for that faculty, but it develops as we are exposed to something and respond to it. Mm -hmm. So in a way, Hey, um, he's repeating what Plotinus said, that the eye must itself have something uh, of the sun in it in order to be able to see the light. Yeah, yeah. And that there's, there is something in us that comes forward, that is evoked in us in response to something in the outer world. Now, if um, by the time you're five, you've been told it's very stupid to keep saying that you see certain things, hear certain things, experience certain things then you stop attending to them and you then stop experiencing them. Mm, mm, mm. You know, one of the problems with the psi phenomena is that it may, I mean, it sounds like a get out clause, I know, and it's often treated like that by some rather contemptuous uh, mainstream scientists, but it may be true that actually the disposition of the mind which approaches it is very important for the phenomenon to be uh, present at all. Yes. Um, I mean, and, and that's certainly understandable to me because one of my sort of core sayings is attention changes the world. I, I don't mean it just makes it look different, but it actually changes the world and it changes ourselves who are doing the paying of the attention. It is therefore a moral act. 
and and it's mutually resonant and as well. It's a mutually <laughs> resonant one. Yes. So I I think you know it's a very good area, but I I'm coming towards the end of my life, and there are many things I need to write about, and I want to see if I can write you know one or two of them before I go, but I just don't have time to embark on. But I'm delighted to be a member of you know the ACDC community and to um, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, I, I have to say the ACDC community tonight has um, a dissident minority uh, led by Peter Bruin, who is one of our star askers of questions. Um, and right. I have to tell you, dear boy, it's about literature and cinema, one of which I know you know about. Um, so he's having another <laughs> go, he says in the chat, asking if there are works of literature or cinema that express or confront these concepts. Please, because I really need to know. Kelly Houston replies, keep at it, Peter, no matrix smiley face and Patricia Bars says Stanley Kubrick 2001 comes to mind for a moment well do you have anything to say about that I mean I, I do oh I, I do in I do indeed um one of the things that I can be um deeply grateful for uh, in living in this troubled time is that it enabled me to experience many things that have been created in the last 70 years and some of those are films and I would go for um, uh, Tarkovsky's Solaris I oh, think yeah. it, there is unfortunately another film called Solaris um, made in the early 90s in America, which is, in my view, a very poor thing indeed. So don't confuse it. I'm talking about a Russian film of, I think, 1972 or 1974, um, made in the days when Tarkovsky was still a dissident in Russia and making films under great difficulty. It's an utterly wonderful film, along with Andrei Rublyov, the slightly earlier film, I think the two greatest films ever made. So yes, I think that's there. But I think consciousness my understanding of consciousness, not in any very explicit way, like a, a, the way a philosopher would have to talk about it, but in another more indirect poetic way, came to me through Wordsworth. So Wordsworth is the great poet of the relationship between consciousness, nature, and the cosmos. Mm. And particularly the early Wordsworth before he became um, rather more conventionally Christian and sort of had to you know, backtrack slightly on certain things. Yes, I mean, quite clearly. I mean, I know you have a great devotion to Wordsworth and uh, much romantic and other uh, British English poetry. And, and that, that seems to me to be a strength because, you know, you are a scientist and, you know, you, you are on both sides of, of that rather artificial divide. And that gives you some, some breadth, I feel, when you're doing your science and the science gives you some precision when you're doing your arty thing, I, I, I suppose. Um, the... I mean, we, we're getting back here. I mean, the questions keep coming up both in my mind and in the chat and, and generally, we keep coming back here to questions like, um, you know, is there a sea change going on or is consciousness altering or whatever? Because, because you know, I think if I think of film in general, I mean, lots of it's very trivial, lots of it's very beautiful, lots of it's very funny, but, but you, you, I can't imagine what a sort of hard-nosed materialist um, you know, blockbuster would be like. <laughs> you see what I mean? I mean, uh, I mean, okay, you can go off into sci-fi. Obviously, that's sort of on our side, rather embarrassingly. But and and equally, I, I just don't know. I mean, apart from you know, people like Zola and Balzac, that sort of gritty, terrible, depressing realism. Most literature, let alone most poetry, is as Les Murray says, as the title and first line of one of his poems, religion is poetry. He sees poems as small religions and, and religions as big poems. I mean, is there something about the arts, you know, which is, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to put it this way, but to be, for simplicity, is on our side or, you know, on the side that Arthur Conan Doyle would have liked. Yes, and, and you know, um, as you, I'm sure, know, Niels Bohr, um, said that when it comes to understanding the basic elements in contemporary physics, only the language of poetry is fit for the task. But he also said, uh, when it comes to talking about matters of the spirit and of the religious sense, once again, it is only the language of poetry that can make any sense here and it doesn't in th that fact doesn't in any sense undermine it as it doesn't undermine science um when it has to rely on poetic use of language so i'm hoping that we will all grow up and see that poetry is not some sort of um 
uh, frippery or some decoration on language, but is actually the core of language when it is at its richest and deepest. And that prose is a sort of aberration uh, which helps us get by because it's very practical in getting lunch and you know dinner um, and that kind of thing. But but <laughs> in fact, one of the things that I argue in this new book is that all the things that we think of, um, or the, many of the things that we think of as somehow uh, dipoles like poetry and prose, um, we tend to privilege the wrong element. We, we tend to think that prose is the core of it and poetry is something around the fringes, rather as people think that the job they do in the city, sitting under strip light, lighting 12 hours a day is what life is really about. And when they go to the opera in the evening and see um, Mozart or something, that's just a pleasant relaxation. Whereas of course, there is no point in making money and so on if one does not understand these richly spiritual things. Um, uh, and and I, I argue that, um, that complexity is prior to simplicity. That simplicity is what we find by cleaving away almost everything around something. And that the complexity is the natural condition, not the putting together of many simple things. And that equally anima animacy is not an aberration in this cosmos. Animacy is, if you like, the, 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 the core. And inanimacy is the limit condition of animacy in which animacy has been reduced almost to nothing. Oh, I like that very much indeed. That, that takes that takes arguing for, but uh, of course, but it, read the I, book. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I, I think it seems familiar to me, and I think it may be because I've had a peek sneak preview of some of the chapters <laughs> of your book. I, I, if I may, yes. just for a moment, to give you a tiny pause, could I say to a lot of the people who are writing in on the, the chat just at the moment, um, Dan Sleaf, or Slife, is it, and Kelly Houston and Brad Hendricks and others, that the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre um, runs a poetry and spirituality course on Sunday afternoons. It's beginning again in two weeks' time, um, where I will be um, I will be uh, trying to put spirit, poetry and spirituality together, a la Ian, and, and you'd all be most welcome to, to find out about that and sign up for it if you wish. It goes on for 10 weeks, and it makes a very nice Sunday afternoon. Sorry about the advertisement, but it's really because I just love this business of, of being able seriously to connect the arts and spiritual matters to mm. deep philosophical thought and so on in a way which doesn't marginalize it in just the way that, 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 that Ian's saying. So um, if you want your poetry and spirituality, there it is. Of course, people have mentioned Anne Michaels, people have mentioned T.S. Eliot and the Four Quartets, and Kelly Houston says, Poetry is co-creation with the muse. Well, yes, where is the muse? I mean, she's, she's up there. I'm very glad she's a pretty girl, and I'm sure she's co-creating with us poets, many of whom are men, but that's how it goes, you know. Um, okay. well, I, I like the idea of co-creation. I mean, it's a very important one. It's a, mm. uh, uh, as, as probably everybody realizes, it's a foundational idea in Buddhism. It's also a, a foundational idea in the philosophy of A.N. Whitehead, who um, more than anybody is uh, the star of my philosophical pantheon these days and uh, has said so many wonderful things. I, in compiling um, the references for this book, I realized that I've referred to Whitehead more than probably anybody at all. Mm -hmm. um, so th that idea is a crucial one, but it comes back to my idea of reverberant, reverberant relationships, which are out of which things emerge. Um, so yeah. they, 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 again, they, it's that resonance yeah. that 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 yes, the co yes. the co is very important to you, and it's very important in that book. And I think that's, and I I don't mean this in a trivial sense. That's very fashionable. I I, I think that is the way that um, sort of popular yeah. feeling goes. Anyway, um, Samuel Ford. Could I just say? Could, could I? No, could I just say, you, you know, you said you, you're very glad to uh, connect poetry and philosophy and these things. And, and I, I, I know exactly why you're saying that, but I'd also say, but of course they were never separate. I mean, it's only the, the problem is in the way we think. You know, and, and one of the things that, that um, thwarted my religious sense, I mean, my parents never took me to church or they had no uh, beliefs of any religious nature. But um, in my teens at school, I started to really understand there's something very profound here. And, um, you know, a lot of what I felt that divine element in, the sacred element, was in, um, 
in poetry, in music, in nature, in buildings that were old and beautiful, and that these things resonated again. And, you know, there was a terribly you know, Puritan streak uh, in the idea, no, 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 it's not that at all. Um, it, it, it's about you must believe this thing and that thing. So now, this is really the left hemisphere. I mean, and it's all about propositions, whereas in my view, belief is about dispositions. It's about the disposition you hold towards the other whatever that other is, another person, the, the world at large, the cosmos. Anyway, I just wanted to put that in, yeah. No, absolutely right. Um, well, there's another question that's come in from Samuel Ford, to which, if you can't answer it, Ian, I've got the answer, um, just in case you Oh, need good. <laughs> um, and, and it goes like this, and I really do know the answer, and I'll tell you what. Does Ian know of any truly hard-nosed materialist rational types that have changed their minds because of his work your work, in other words, what experiences can open a mind that is firmly closed? Well, I might crib from you. I, I think there was a man called Anthony Flew, who was a sort of mainstream uh, materialist philosopher who suddenly realised that this was wrong. And of course... Oh, there's also A.J. Eyre, isn't there, who had a near-death experience? Materialist um, analytical philosopher. Well, yes, unfortunately, that near-death experience only sort of um, changed his mind for a, for a month or two. Yes. But um, he went back, to, went back to his boring old ways. But, <laughs> but yes, I, I'm, I'm sure there are. But you give me your answer, uh, well, my, I please. Mean, I, I want it, to learn, Lance. Just because we've had on, on this series, as you know, um, Jeffrey Kripal, who wrote a short, rather smart little book called The Flip. And you, it could be about anything, The Flip, but The Flip it's about is precisely the flip of, of um, serious scientists and, and materialist philosophers who've had experiences, you know, Damascene, as we now call them, Damascus Road experiences, which have made them think, I can't have been right. I can't have been seeing the whole picture. And, and that little book has lots of examples and talks about it. And Jeffrey Kripal will talk about this endlessly. And, and of course, one of the people who, who has influenced um, Kripal is you. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, oh. you're not the only one, you know, because, you know, you're a serious scientist and, and you, you are open, even if you're not going to, you know, cross the sticks or, you know, cross, cross, cross the Rubicon in, into the, um, let's say, uh, full Psi believer, um, you, you certainly, like, like Bernardo Castro, created a, a philosophical and scientific situation in which we no longer feel foolish in considering near-death mm. experiences mm. and such like, seriously. Absolutely not. And there are some things that, you know, like the near-death experiences and so on, that I think have to be real. I mean, the whole idea that they're just a, a meltdown in the brain can't be right, because when people do have meltdowns in the brain, or, or become delirious or demented or whatever, they, they, the experiences are entirely different and don't seem afterwards like more real than real life. They seem afterwards like what they were, delusions. Mm. Yes, I mean, the, the, that is clearly right. And, and of course, the, the bundle of sticks argument is, is still pretty good. I mean, we have every Saturday night and on many other occasions at the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre, we have mediumship demonstrations. And sometimes it's better and sometimes it's worse, like all things. But some of the best mediums, and mm. I sat down the other night, last Saturday night, and there was a medium giving information to somebody. And I wrote down 12 things which she said to this person. And because I know the medium, because I know the situation, I am 99.9% .9 certain she couldn't possibly have known. And she produced 12 different things. So if mediums are connecting somewhere and Arthur, and Arthur Conan Doyle, after near-death experiences are, are going in another direction, I, I think what you've just said is right, isn't it? That, that, that there are such things. I mean, how we interpret them, exactly what they mean in terms of the universal consciousness and the rest is another matter. But at least we must start by mm. stopping mm. trying to say that, what is it, 20 mm. million near-death experiences have now been mentioned or reported and none of them happened? I mean, come <laughs> on, you know. You'd go with me on that, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we must I be getting near, near the Very end. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> because because we've, um, we've, we've been taxing you with both the questions and, and, and your lecture, and lots of other things are coming in. So I think we'll just do, we'll just do a couple um, here, if you like. Um, oh, oh, well, Kelly Houston has said, I'd like to hear more info on that poetry session. All I can say, my dear, is simply go to the Arthur Conan Doyle website. Sorry for, sorry, and for putting that in as well. Um, uh, well, we have uh, near-death experiences, or the master and his emissary is something that Sam Samuel Ford says. Yeah, I don't understand it. Um, but people keep coming back in the chat to consciousness. I mean, someone's just mm. asked again the question I asked, you know, 
does local consciousness, our consciousness, fit into the great consciousness? That's that's mm. clear, that sort of Hindu idea, the Buddhist idea. The people mm. are really wor worried about that. That's what they want to feel. I think that their consciousness will yes. connect in some way yeah. to that bigger. Ab ab absolutely, but it, you know the, the 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 simple, neatest answer to this is in the idea of division and union being themselves unified. So there is a force for division and a force for union in the cosmos, and that's how things come into being. Mm. But those two forces need to be unified, present together, mm. not just one or the other. Neither so, of those on their own is yeah. fruitful. I mean, and, and in fact, David Bohm said something almost exactly like that. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, and of course, Bernardo Castro has, has, has said that when he's had... Um, spiritual experiences under, under, under legal drug situations, um, he has um, been rather surprised that the divine consciousness has been able to talk to him so clearly in his own terms, in his own language. And his conclusion, and possibly that of the divine consciousness also, the conclusion is that we are enabling the universal consciousness to see and understand things about itself and about us, which is in the end, the same thing by asking questions. It's not that it's all up there and we get a bit, get a few crumbs if we're lucky. If we come up with something, we're giving back. And and the chap on the other side, the big chap, is saying, "Oh, that's great! I didn't know that." <laughs> Quite an no. interesting well, co-creation. We, absolutely. And Harold Bloom said something rather good, I think, about Shakespeare, that Shakespeare created himself in the creation of his creations if yeah. you like yeah and, and that's a not i often think that shakespeare is a very good um metaphor for divine creation in fact i can say quite a lot about that on another occasion if you want. um no doubt you don't but uh, <laughs> but the, the the point there is that you know um we create ourselves in the act of creation and i think that the divine cosmos is finding out what it is in the process of yeah it's it doesn't know in advance either what it is or what will come to be if it did it would just be a cynical act of unfolding something that it knew all along mm. and it is a true process of creation and therefore absolutely he saw that it was good not he knew that it was good because oh yeah tuesday morning or whatever it, we're going to have this bit yeah. uh, he it it was new, even in the Genesis story. And there are many other mythologies that express this idea that creation is an ongoing process um, that isn't sealed and delivered. This is whitehead and process theology to some extent, is it? It is, it is, yes. Um, I'm afraid so, yes. <laughs> Um, well, look, I, I really do think I mean, we, we, we can't keep you uh, very much longer. And we've had a lot of incre incredibly um, uh, interesting questions. But uh, the, the most interesting one for you, Ian, is going to be the easiest one or possibly the most difficult to answer. It, it just, we just need a date. I, I wonder if Ian can give us a date to put on our calendars for the forthcoming publication. And I know it hasn't been easy. It, it hasn't been easy and it, it's still uh, having certain things happening but it, i think the date is going to be um th as it were the first of october i'm afraid i had hoped it might be earlier but it, it will probably be then so yes I, and, I, and if yeah, i may do yeah. do a little do a little advert for my <laughs> for, for something i do uh, for the last year since we started lockdown i've been reading a poem every day on the internet and I, I've now almost reached 365, at which point I will stop. But if anybody's interested, um, that's that's something else that I have enjoyed doing um, and hope can offer some sake to well, people. And that, uh, that, those wonderful poems which you read so well, um, they, are, they come under the aegis of a title which you look up, I think, on the YouTube or whatever, which is wonderfully ambiguous. It's called Channel McGilchrist. So is channel an imperative <laughs> verb, you know? Yes. Channel McGillchrist, um, and you'll, you'll get his poems and lots more about him. And as soon as the book has a proper date and a proper subtitle and all the rest of it, it'll all be there, I presume. Um, yes, yes, of course. And at some point I'm going to begin reading some passages, not, not in the next couple of months, but nearer to the time it's coming out and, and putting them up as substantial podcasts uh, which people can access on, on for free on 
That's absolutely great. Well, I mean, thank you very much indeed. Um, there are various interesting things in, in, in the chat there. Um, some people, um, Pauline Morgan has put up an interesting article from the man who experienced the flip. And um, someone's put up um, the website, which if you want to join this poetry and spirituality course. Um, and I sincerely hope, in fact, I know for certain that Ian will be coming back. And, and especially around the time of the publication of his book, when of course we will talk about it some more and, and you'll, you'll get all the details uh, uh, that you need. Um, I have to say, this has been one of the most vigorous chat series that I've seen in, in, in any of these talks. And I'm, I'm, I'm really rather touched by it. And Hazel Martin has just put up um, the website for Channel McGilchrist, there you are. So please everybody look at this. Um, I'm going to have to stop now, um, but uh, I, I'm going to leave it on Perhaps Scott could leave it on so that people can look at all those things in the, and I don't know whether Scott, you would like just to um, guide people a little bit through those many um, references which are in the chat. Would, would that be enough, Ian? Have you had enough now? Well, I'm I'm both happy to stop now or happy to go on to nine o'clock, but it is, you know, I'm in your hands. Okay. Well, I think, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I always believe that the, the great wit, um, uh, Sidney Smith, um, when asked about how to deal with conversation, said, uh, short views for God's sake. <laughs> yes, it is. You, of course, are famous for writing some of the longest books, so perhaps that would be... Uh, um, great um, great so, I mean, I, think I can hand I... over to Scott then. And um, can, can I yep. say thank you very much?